your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. This is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh no. By all outward appearances, Colonel Russell Williams was a paradigm of the honorable military man. Over the course of his twenty three year career, he served as commanding officer at Camp Mirage, a secretive logistics facility, piloted flights for VIPs including the Queen of England and Prime Minister of Canada, and by 2009 was the wing commander at CFB Trenton, one of Canada's principal air transport bases. Colleagues described him as a shining bright star of the Canadian military, unaware that mere months after his promotion to colonel, he would break into a woman's home, blindfold, bind and intimately assault her. It wouldn't take long for Williams' repulsive crimes to escalate to murder, and it would be the community he betrayed, alongside a meticulous interrogation, that would bring his sadism to light. Between 2007 and 2009, the Ontario communities of Orleans and Tweed were plagued by a series of break-ins and thefts. Strangely, no jewellery, electronics or even cash went missing during these incidents. The burglar was only interested in collecting underwear, clothing, sex toys, and photographs from women and girls as young as 15 years old. In retrospect, it's clear these communities had a perverted and potentially violent offender on their hands, especially considering one victim found a taunting note typed on her computer. But whether due to a lack of usable evidence, embarrassment deterring some victims from reporting their experience, or many break-ins initially going undetected, no tangible action was taken at this stage. By September of 2009, burglary wasn't cutting it anymore. The predator needed to inflict violence and fear to continue reaping his thrills. On the 17th, a woman in Tweed was beaten, bound, choked and assaulted in her own home, all the while being photographed by her attacker. On September 30th, another local woman suffered an almost identical attack. One of these victims recounted to police that her assailant's voice sounded familiar. She struggled to place exactly where she'd heard him before, eventually landing on a resident of Tweed named Larry Jones. On October 29th, police searched Jones's home for memory cards, explicit videos, photographs, zip ties and women's shoes, among other items which would identify the perpetrator. They were able to clear Jones as a suspect, oblivious to the fact that the real culprit, Colonel Russell Williams, lived right next door. It's fair to say that this close call emboldened Williams, because he would commit his first murder less than a month later. On November 25th, around 20 minutes drive from the Trenton base, Corporal Marie France Como was found dead in her home. Just six months prior, the 38-year-old had achieved her dream job as a military flight attendant, working at the same base as Williams. As her commanding officer, Williams had access to information including her schedule and address, and he would betray this trust that his rank entailed to enter Como's home undetected. He first crawled in through a basement window when she was away on a trip, spending over an hour taking photos of himself in her underwear. He may have had the same plan when he invaded the corporal's home a second time, but Williams was caught off guard when, with the help of one of her cats, Como discovered him in her basement. What followed was over four hours of torture and assault before she was ultimately suffocated by tape placed over her mouth and nose. And as her commanding officer, Williams would later write a letter of condolence to her grieving family. Like many serial killers, Williams' first murder may have been impulsive, even accidental, but he clearly acquired a taste for this kind of sadosexual violence, and soon began stalking 27-year-old Jessica Elizabeth Lloyd. Williams would later tell police he first saw Lloyd exercising in her home, and after ascertaining that she lived alone, decided she would be his next target. On the night of January 28th, he parked his SUV in a field by Lloyd's house, lying in wait for her to return home and retire for the night. His plan was briefly disrupted when an unknown vehicle approached the house. Williams at first assumed this was Lloyd, but he soon watched the unexpected guest drive away. Lloyd herself eventually arrived, sending what would be her last text at 10.36pm before Williams finally entered her home and began what would be hours of torment. He assured Lloyd that if she cooperated, he wouldn't kill her, and with this false promise, he took her back to his cottage in Tweed, continuing his grisly work. What Williams didn't know was that by the time he strangled Lloyd to death with a rope, police were already investigating her disappearance. Her friends and family hadn't heard from her, 
and she hadn't shown up for work, managing the district's school bus lines the next morning. So police swiftly treated the situation as suspicious. Williams was also oblivious to the fact that Lloyd's mysterious visitor had been a female police officer. She had noticed a suspicious SUV parked by Lloyd's house and decided to check on the residence. The officer had knocked on the door, but when there was no answer, she left. Though the presence of this vehicle was also reported by three local witnesses who passed by that night. This information would help police obtain tire tread and boot impressions left in the mud and snow behind Lloyd's house. With this evidence on hand, on February 4th, police set up a roadblock near the scene along Highway 37. After stopping and questioning motorists for 11 hours, Williams finally came to their attention thanks to the distinctive tire tread of his SUV. Williams agreed to an interview the following Sunday at the Ottawa Police Service headquarters, under the impression they were still investigating his neighbour, Larry Jones. In fact, it would later be discovered that Williams dumped Lloyd's body in an area Jones frequented and went hunting. Unfortunately, this feeble attempt at framing his neighbour wouldn't be enough to fool the officer tasked with interviewing Williams, Detective Sergeant Jim Smith. Smith is an expert in behavioural science, criminal psychology and profiling. A soft-spoken man, his approach to this interview is structured according to the PEACE model. This non-accusatory information-gathering tactic gradually shepherds the suspect towards confession over five phases. By the time Smith enters the interrogation room, he and the Canadian Special Behavioural Studies team have already completed step one, preparation and planning. Smith greets Williams, informed by a thorough psychological profile, and will design his questions based on this understanding of the colonel's personality and thought processes. His aim is to at the very least obtain forensic evidence and lock Williams into statements that can later be refuted and used against him, with the ultimate prize being a full confession. This is no easy feat. Williams isn't under arrest and could at any moment choose to end the interview or consult a lawyer who would no doubt instruct him to remain silent. Luckily for Smith, Williams' own egotism and thrill-seeking impulses will steer him right into the detective's hands. Right. You just have to see Russell. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was was Russ as well. Oh, yeah. And he took, uh, took every number I had. Yeah, now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was All great. Right. Glad to see you. Uh, I'm just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone just yeah. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I or? have never been interviewed like this. Before the pair even broached the subject of the interview, much can be gleaned from body language and the positioning of the room. Russell's attitude is palpably casual. There's no hint of anxiety or concern, at least outwardly, as he grins directly at the interrogation room's camera. Violent offenders often get a thrill from their ability to deceive those around them, living a respectable life alongside their crimes. Dennis Rader was known as a loving father and husband whilst committing at least 10 murders between 1974 and 1991. Ed Kemper maintained friendships with police officers until he was found guilty of eight counts of murder in 1973. It's no stretch to assume that the opportunity to win over and deceive a detective similarly feeds into Williams's pride. Of course, Smith knows this, and in every capacity presents himself to Williams as a warm, understanding confidant. Rather than sitting across from Williams, with the desk in between them, this barrier sits to the side, with Smith's chair angled directly towards his suspect. Smith leans forward to assert confidence, as shrinking or facing away from Williams could quickly convince him not to take the detective seriously. Smith's forward position doubly serves to signal interest in what Williams has to say. If Williams feels validated and heard, he'll speak more freely during this portion of the interview, fostering an openness with Smith that may help when the time comes to extract a confession. Finally, Smith clasps his hands in his lap, in full view. Like a handshake, this body language conveys that Smith holds no weapons, that he has nothing to hide and poses no threat to Williams. With this, Smith has fully engaged Williams, and as the piece approach directs, will now explain the reason for this interview. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm-hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So 
Um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Smith frames the beginning of the interview almost as an apology to Williams. He explains that Lloyd's disappearance is an emergent, time-sensitive case, using this to justify speaking with Williams on a Sunday afternoon. This implicitly acknowledges to Williams that this conversation is an inconvenience, that he's doing Smith a favour by being there, and thereby making him feel he has the power in their dynamic. Smith reinforces with phrases such as, I appreciate it, and these efforts to make Williams feel comfortable and in control underpin this phase of the interview. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today, okay? okay. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or I not, am a coffee I didn't guy. want to drink yeah. in front of you, so... No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely... Are they black? Yeah, they're just black with, uh, with sugar. Um, Started your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Piece, piece of gum <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe everybody with respect. I don't yeah. want to ask if they do the same for me. At surface level, this line about treating everyone with respect reinforces to Williams that this is a routine, unexceptional interview and he isn't under any more suspicion than anyone else in Tweed. But Smith's focus on an exchange of respect also plays into Williams' role as a commanding officer. Interactions in the military world are built upon a foundation of deference and honour, and someone as high-ranking as Williams would value, and even expect, respect above all else. This line wouldn't go down quite as well with a young, rebellious offender, but engaging in these social conventions with Williams is a powerful move to enhance rapport between the detective and his suspect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version, so okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, basically in Canada, uh, as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right. okay? Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, is mm -hmm. that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yep. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? Mm -hmm. Here, Smith strengthens Williams's feeling of control over the interview, explicitly stating he has the power to end it at any time. Smith explains that he's obviously not under arrest banishing any concern Williams might have about being suspected. He explains the door isn't locked, and his colleague Teresa will walk Williams to the lobby at his beck and call. Naming his colleague instills a sense of familiarity and again, comfort in Williams. And yet, Smith has chosen to sit between the Colonel and the door. Despite all of these assurances that Williams can leave whenever he wants, Smith is doing everything in his power to make him stay. After all, at this stage, there's nothing stopping Williams from fleeing the country or even striking again. Even if only subconsciously, walking past Smith to get to the door would be an insult and would betray the exchange of respect the two have established. Williams may not realise it yet, but he has quite literally been backed into a corner. Um, if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that, uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, sure. um, you, just, uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is, um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, okay? Right. Um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the, uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. 
and um, then most recently we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance, mm -hmm. okay? So essentially, when you're looking at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges, all right? Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement, okay? And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? So. And that's why it's important that we... Uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm -hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and okay. uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Okay. Um, do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. no, I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm -hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. Smith is beginning to sow the first seeds of unease in Williams' mind. Listing the legal terminology of each specific crime would heighten the anxiety of any guilty party. But this is softened by Smith, stating they're seeking those responsible for one or all of these crimes. For Williams, this suggests that police don't even know if one person did all this, and their lack of understanding must mean they haven't caught on to him. But on the subject of lawyers, Smith doesn't ask if Williams wants to call one. Rather, if he has any reason to want a lawyer. This meticulous phrasing is the first hint that Smith wants Williams to speak on his own actions. They're not merely interested in him as a witness. And the pressure to reveal what he has done and why will only build from here. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm -hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today, okay? okay? And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person of authority, mm -hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So, no, understood. Um, and the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that, uh, you know, you mentioned a second ago about uh, Ms. Como um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things. Um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases, um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm -hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? okay. But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being yeah. recorded, right? So. Um, understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was, uh, was very close. Williams, without prompting, acknowledges that the sexual assaults occurred close to his cottage on Cozy Cove Lane. He notes that he doesn't know much about the first case, but is aware the second incident happened just a few doors away. Importantly, Williams offers this information after Smith has just emphasized his right to silence, likely in an attempt to present himself as helpful and transparent, though not so invested in the cases as to seem suspicious. Yeah. So certainly at the time, you OPP did a door-to-door. Uh, -door. Yeah. yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night, so I spoke with a couple of guys then. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from mm -hmm. uh, looking at the different cases. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, okay? Mm -hmm. um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there is a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Smith uses Williams' knowledge of the case as a springboard towards accusation. Observing Williams has hit the nail on the head regarding issues that have been drawn to the police's attention. The Colonel's closeness to the cases are not facts, but issues. 
and Smith follows this by explicitly stating that Williams has a connection to all four attacks. This phrasing could easily be interpreted as the detective seeking information Williams might have as a witness, but Smith's vocabulary is intentional and slowly shifting towards accusatory. Confrontation isn't something he can introduce suddenly, or Williams will be scared silent, so he must first draw the suspect in. Geographically, and then I guess I drive past, uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there is a, a connection, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's why, uh, I'll be quite frank with you, that's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there, because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a, uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base, I was in uniform at the time, so... Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made. Um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents. Uh, I think in Tweed. Uh, three doors down, yeah. Yeah. Very close, absolutely. Again, Williams offers specific information that Smith hasn't requested. Crucially, when Smith does begin asking direct questions about Williams' activities and knowledge of the crimes, he's not quite so eager to provide helpful answers. Friday on the day, I was um, Friday on the day I was at home most of the time. Most of the day, I had a sort of a stomach flu. Okay, in Ottawa or Tweed? In Tweed. In Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we backtrack then. So all day Friday, you're at home. Yeah. And then w what time do you leave to go to the base to sleep there on the Friday night? Um, not sure. Probably just, you know, went in for just before bed. Uh, so I probably left tweeted between 8 and 9 or so. Okay. So we backtrack from there. Um, you, when did you arrive at your home uh, at the cottage? Uh, no, I had been in Tweed all week. Yeah. Uh, the week prior now. Um, yeah, I think that's the case. I was in Tweed all week. Flew Saturday. Headed to Ottawa Saturday night. Okay. Do you remember what time you left the base that night? Mm, I don't remember anything peculiar, so I would say, uh, I don't know, probably 7 to 9, somewhere in that range. That's when you, you left? Left the base, yeah. And what, what That's a 45 minute transit. So. 45 minutes home? Yeah. Okay. It takes Williams a concerning amount of time to answer these questions about his timeline, and he's able to provide very little detail. This certainly doesn't look good, but we must remember that he's being asked to recall his movements from nearly two weeks prior. It would be difficult for anyone to remember specific events if their days truly had been unremarkable. What's genuinely concerning is that it would be effortless for him to assist police in verifying this information. Military bases are highly secure locations, with constant surveillance, to-the-minute schedules, and keycards scanned at entry points. When he so readily offered other information, we must ask why he doesn't enthusiastically direct Smith toward that kind of verification. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that... Uh, that Marie Franz uh, Coleman. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? Uh, I do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, well, as soon as the uh, the off staff and the base learned, they told me. You may have noticed that until this point, Williams has had a habit of eagerly nodding his head. This has usually occurred when he answers questions or listens to clarification from Smith. Yet, when asked directly about a specific victim. Williams's rapid nods are replaced by shakes from side to side. Nodding one's head whilst talking is often an encouragement for the listener to agree, and we see it serve this function whenever Williams makes eye contact with Smith, nodding in earnest to seek affirmation. On the other hand, shaking one's head, at least when the context doesn't call for disapproval, is a common involuntary response. This reflex may indicate Williams doesn't believe what he's saying, or it may signal that he doesn't want to dwell on a particular topic. In reality, Williams didn't learn about Como's death via email. He found out when he murdered her with his own two hands. Whether he's subconsciously acknowledging this lie, or steering Smith away from the topic, Williams' body language shows clear signs of guilt. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you got that email notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a 
a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in. Just a second. Um, no, I'm sorry, I can't remember what day that was, but... Uh, What I what we learned after the fact was that the um, the MPs had learnt uh, of her death. I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. As before, Williams could easily state he isn't sure what he did that week, and offered to check back through emails and keycard logs to confirm that information. Instead, he eventually gives up on answering at all. Moving on to describe the administrative processes at the base following Como's death. He seems to think that if his answers appear thoughtful and helpful, he will appear innocent, and that will be enough. But to the observer, this reads as him evading a defined timeline and concealing the resources that would corroborate his activity. Of course, Smith notices that he never got a real answer, and requests again that Williams explain what he did the week of Como's death. So that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yep. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa early in the week uh, for some meetings over in uh, in Gatineau for one of the um, actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director and when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week, again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. So if we were to uh, to you know do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, absolutely did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, um, I th you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how. Um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. After Williams dances around the subject of his schedule some more, Smith laughs heartily at a joke that the colonel makes, followed by the compliment that he seems to be an intelligent person. This ego boost is well-timed, as Smith is about to make a request that will no doubt test their rapport and set Williams' alarm bells ringing. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch, uh, I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally, yes. Okay. So you have an idea of, obviously, the forensic capabilities, things like mm -hmm. that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, what do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. Okay. All right. To maintain his image of innocence, Williams readily agrees to provide blood samples, fingerprints, and footwear impressions. You might have missed it, but at that last request, Williams quickly glances down at his feet. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. And with the benefit of hindsight, we can observe that this is a moment of sudden, sharp fear. Williams has just realised he's wearing the same shoes he wore the night he attacked Lloyd. Of course, saying no to this third request would draw unsavoury questions his way. So for now, Williams must remain outwardly calm, though his body has surely been flooded with adrenaline. Um, I think that's what we're going we're gonna to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now, we have a process we have to go through to do that. Okay. Um, and for the blood sample, uh, I don't take the blood sample. We have specially trained officers that are trained to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step out and make sure they're still available. It's at this point that Smith exits the room for around 20 minutes, leaving Williams with nothing but his festering anxiety to keep him occupied. The impact this time alone has on his mental state and confidence manifests plainly in his body language. 
Where before Williams mirrored Smith's open, clasped hands posture, he now sits with his arms firmly crossed over his chest. Williams now knows for certain that he's not here to continue framing Larry Jones. The Colonel himself is under suspicion. This is well established as defensive body language, and the indignant questions which follow display his insecurity even further. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible, yeah. Because, uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Williams's facial expression here, head tilted down and eyebrows raised, seems markedly more aggressive than the congenial way he's addressed Smith previously. His posturing is like that of a stern teacher, or perhaps a disappointed drill sergeant. Yet, this assertion of dominance is undermined by the line, They thought you thought I did this. Williams' awkward phrasing adds two degrees of separation between him and the crime, indicating his growing apprehension towards Smith's suspicion. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, the military certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Ms. Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. But I appreciate that. Williams doesn't seem satisfied by Smith's assurances, muttering about the rumour mill to voice his displeasure, but perhaps realising that his self-consciousness could be seen as selfish in the face of two violent murders, he tacks on a weak, I appreciate that. This attempt to maintain his integrity falls on deaf ears, as Smith acknowledges Williams' gratitude with a curt, okay. This gives Williams space to worry that the backpedalling wasn't enough to soften his perceived selfishness, Positioning Smith's respect as something that the Colonel must recover. Unbeknownst to him, Smith's respect is purely a tool he uses to manipulate Williams, and these tactics have earned him evidence placing Williams at a crime scene. Smith has gained the upper hand, so from here it is safe for him to risk offending the suspect, and to dive deeper into the third step of the peace approach, account clarification and challenge. Is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of, anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why, if if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. Okay. You may be wondering why Williams doesn't say, sure, I was there, I repaired that woman's deck, or we had a brief affair, or some other innocent story that could explain away any DNA evidence. Whether Williams knows it or not, this choice is a trap carefully laid by Smith. If Williams said there were affairs, he then has to construct a whole narrative around that, building lies upon lies to keep track of, and no doubt get caught out in. On top of that, his name and reputation would be irretrievably tarnished. If Williams maintains that he's never been in those homes, Smith will of course be able to refute this with the DNA evidence. Williams simply can't win at this crossroad, though his chuckling and exasperated sighs suggest he's more concerned about how rude it is for Smith to even suggest he's been unfaithful. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any of those residences? Yeah. Let's, let's focus on, well, for instance, uh, I believe, let me just check the name there, make sure I've got the right address. I'm talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there in, uh, in Tweed. Uh, the second incident on your, on your road there, yeah. a couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? No. We met her once, I think the first summer um, we were there, so in 04. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, Russ, uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, Are you familiar with how C, uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. I okay. guess so. Um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so uh, precise that um, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back 15 years ago when I started in, uh, in violent crime investigation. Yeah. Um, for us to get a DNA match, the sample we had to find was, um, you know, probably would have filled half of one of these cups. Okay. You know, because they destroy so much of the, uh, the sample in the, in the testing. Okay. Um, essentially, 
DNA has become more and more precise to the point where when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for 30 seconds, yeah. walked out. CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure. Um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah, no, that uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or uh, our skin cells contain our DNA, yeah. and that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh -huh. quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. Smith is essentially bluffing here. Whilst DNA testing in 2010 is worlds more reliable than even a decade earlier, it remains reliant on the quality and quantity of the sample. Some samples only have enough DNA to rule out certain suspects, falling short of narrowing it down to one. Whether the sample is touch DNA or a hair follicle, left in the sun or a high foot traffic area, these factors all contribute to the reliability of this evidence. It's simply too early for Smith to know he can catch Williams for Lloyd's murder with DNA, but Williams doesn't appreciate these facts. As far as he knows, Smith is telling him he's scientifically and provably trapped. The next 10 minutes follow a familiar pattern. Smith asks benign questions about Williams' schedule, or how he paid for dinner, peppering in some more incriminating queries. Did Williams drive off the road near Lloyd's house for any reason? Had he met this victim before? Williams plays dumb regardless of Smith's rationale, followed by Smith reassuring him that these are routine questions. Identifying common assumptions other ordinary people make at other ordinary interviews. To Williams, this may appear comforting, but Smith is intentionally chipping away at the Colonel's confidence in his patchy story. At the same time, the detective's soothing statements keep him firmly in the position of the good, respectable cop. Notable amongst these exchanges is Smith's revelation that the police have obtained tire tread impressions from the scene of Lloyd's murder. Has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all um, for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So, yeah, yeah. Is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would it cause you to, to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of roadway? No, that's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway and I'm just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to, uh, uh, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Um, would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property, um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. Okay. Um, they took, uh, they examined those tire tracks, mm -hmm. and uh, they ha have contacts in the tire business. Obviously, mm -hmm. tire tracks mm -hmm. are a, a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, shortly after um, this investigation started. They identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the other uh, one of the other things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They they talk to witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house. Uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder, okay. okay. Maybe consistent with other things, but consistent yeah. with a Pathfinder. Um, and the uh, what they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width, mm -hmm. okay. Because different vehicles, different makes, models have wheelbase width, so yeah. they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, yeah. okay, and determine what the uh, the width is, sure. and then they can enter that into a vehicle database and it will spit out the types of vehicles, yeah. okay? Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very, very close to the width of the, uh, of the tires uh, that were left in that field, mm -hmm. okay? After allowing Williams to lie about not driving off the road, Smith immediately confronts him with the fact the tire treads they found are an identical match to Williams' SUV. Before his suspect can properly react, Smith compounds the pressure further 
by revealing a police officer witnessed an SUV parked near Lloyd's house on the night in question. Even the wheelbase width of Williams's car corresponds with impressions found at the scene, and at this point, he doesn't have much choice but to dig in his heels and double down on his lies. From Williams's perspective, the police now have infallible DNA evidence, impressions from boots he wore that night, and have even matched his car and tyres to the scene. Military colleagues have commented on how exceptionally calm Williams was under pressure, and now, locked into easily refutable lies, not reacting seems to be his chosen strategy. For Smith, this lack of a retort only cements his guilt. Williams's body language is speaking for him. Um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, it's not off the road, no. Okay. If you look closely, Williams's eyes are constantly darting back and forth between Smith and something to his left. Based on the room's layer, as we see it from above, the only significant object to Williams's left is the door. The Colonel is seeking escape, his fight or flight response fully activated, and Smith takes this as the perfect opportunity to once again leave his suspect to stew in his anxiety. When Smith returns, he first seeks to re-establish the exchange of respect. Only this time, he enters the room ready to challenge Williams directly, wielding respect as a weapon to inflict shame upon the Colonel. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right, now I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right, that's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, Okay. Yeah. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like, uh, like fingerprint comparisons. Okay. You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yep. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. Smith revisits Williams's request for discretion, using it to reinforce the transactional nature of this conversation. Why should he give Williams discretion if he can't give Smith honesty? Not only does this frame honesty, and by extension a confession, as something owed to Smith, but the implication that he has disappointed the detective and betrayed his simple rule of respect further injures Williams's self-esteem and honorable self-image. He cannot respond as the righteous military man because betraying the exchange of respect has fragmented that persona. Equally, he is not ready to admit to the sadistic core of his identity. And so, in the face of this evidence, 
Williams is quite literally rendered speechless. Smith, too, remains silent, aware that repeating his question would only release the pressure that crushes Williams. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. It's fair to assume that Williams isn't the only person in Canada to own those shoes, those tyres, that car, and if he were innocent, he might dismiss this confrontation, perhaps even get aggressive at the suggestion he's responsible. Smith even gives him the opportunity to offer another, upright explanation for why he was near Lloyd's house. But Williams' mind is preoccupied with processing what's happening, the inconceivable situation he finds himself in. His quiet analysis of the boot prints only amplifies suspicion, and Williams' awareness of this, no doubt, sends his mind spiralling further into fear. It's, um, well, you need to explain it, because this is the other problem we're having, Russell, okay? Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence. And okay? So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized, okay? You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male A, on Marie France Como's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Science is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. There's no point in holding back now. Smith continues to pile on the pressure, dealing the blows that Williams's house is being searched, his car has been seized, and, tragically, that his wife must now come to terms with his crimes. Overwhelmed, Williams can't manage more than to nod as Smith explains the ways his world is crumbling around him. Backed by the evidence he's accumulated, Smith's challenge to Williams has completely broken the Colonel's confidence and ability to continue denying. His silence no longer hides quiet calculation. Instead, disarmed from denial, Williams simply has nothing to say. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're applying, the investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is the practical steps <coughs> in an investigation like this. And Russell, me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, 
Where's your credibility? Where's your believability? It's through this vulnerability that Smith steers Williams towards the peace system's fourth phase, closure. Smith will present confession as the only way for his suspect to exercise power over the consequences he faces. Without control over the facts, Williams can only exert agency over how others perceive him in spite of the facts. But Smith can't rely on this notion to make Williams talk. There's still nothing stopping him from remaining silent or calling a lawyer. The detective must continue to magnify Williams' anxiety, impeding his ability to think clearly and realise he should request a lawyer, and spurring him into recklessly spill information. To achieve this, Smith imbues the situation with urgency, playing up the idea that Williams only has a small window left to rescue his credibility. There's also a strong sense of hopelessness in Smith's words. His evidence is provided by experts. The information he has is infallible, so Williams can forget about giving denial another try. At this point, without a body or confession, it's still not certain that Williams will be found guilty in court. Smith must convince him there's no escape from justice, though that might not be completely true. As Smith says, the myriad of searches being carried out aren't decisions that we say yes or no to. As far as Williams is concerned, his guilty verdict is just as inevitable. The only thing he can protect is his integrity. I know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Okay, because uh, don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it, got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. Williams' tight-lipped exterior is clearly close to bursting. He wants to understand exactly what outcome Smith is proposing, perhaps hoping to make some kind of deal. Smith, unable to administer a plea bargain in the middle of an interrogation, instead outlines the alternative to confession, being seen as a cold-blooded psychopath. Smith further manipulates the rapport he initially built with Williams, portraying silence as proof he never deserved Smith's respect. In doing so, Smith again dangles the carrot of his approval over his suspect, tendering this prize in exchange for the truth. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do? What's that? So you talk about perception. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah. And the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. Before he will admit defeat, Williams grasps for another source of control over this situation. He expresses to Smith his concern that all this sordid business will impact the Canadian military and his poor, despondent wife. Smith counters this reach for power with the threat that not confessing would waste $10 million, a huge sum of money that could otherwise be spent on the country Williams was sworn to protect. Okay. Okay. So where is she? Get him out. 
Bingo. Williams is ready to tell all. It's interesting to note that Smith first pursues information about Lloyd's body, rather than an outright confession. This may be because a finite fact, such as the body's location, is easier for Williams to divulge than the vast details of his crimes. But it's also important to consider that without a body, a murder case has no real foundation. Confessions can be retracted or explained away as coerced. But if Williams can successfully lead them to Lloyd's body, there's no way to deny that he was involved with her death. Let me see what I got here. I might have something. Is she inside, outside? How long was she alive for? Almost 24 hours, not quite. Okay. Russ? You're doing the right thing here. Okay. At this point, the game is won. Utterly dejected, Williams will spend the coming hours delving into how and why he attacked a community he swore to protect. At least as far as a sadistic predator can explain the rationale behind assault and murder. The fifth and final phase of the peace model represents evaluation. The outcomes of the interview and the information gleaned are assessed, and decisions about further action made. Retrospect allows us to reflect on how Sound Smith's work was. On October 18, 2010, Williams will plead guilty to two counts of first-degree murder, two counts each of sexual assault and forcible containment, and 82 counts of breaking and entering. It will be 25 years before he can apply for parole, and it might be satisfying to know that Williams doesn't just lose his freedom. Despite Smith's assurances, he never had a chance of salvaging his reputation. Countless photographs of Williams in the underwear he stole would be released to the public, and his own careful notes about each home he invaded would drag the true extent of his perversion into the open, plain for all to see. But Williams and Smith aren't the only characters in this story, and an evaluation of this case would not be complete without accounting for the lies that were lost. Jessica Elizabeth Lloyd was so close and connected with her family that no contact from her within just 24 hours was enough for them to report her missing, and for the police to treat this absence as suspicious. Lisa Ray, a close friend to Lloyd, described her as the kind of friend everyone should strive to be. Lisa would name her daughter Charlotte Jessica Ray in honour of this life cut cruelly short. Marie France Como adored her job as a military flight attendant and had been serving honourably for 12 years. Como's colleague and friend, France Bro, shared that just after six months on the job, she was chosen to work as the Prime Minister and Governor General's flight attendant. While flying with the Prime Minister, she travelled to Japan, Singapore and India. She told France years ago that one day she wanted to visit India. As a result of a monster at the periphery of her life, it would be her final mission.